Right. It's good to be with you again this afternoon. It's been a while since I've been able to record anything, and that's just been uh, an account of busyness. Uh, I'm Dion Foster, and uh, welcome to this little channel again. It's not a lecture, just a thought. And uh, today, again, uh, just a, an opportunity to share one or two thoughts with you uh, sitting here behind my desk. I'm actually looking out on my pool outside uh, the window here. It's a beautiful summer's day. Uh, towards the end of the first week of February here in South Africa. And uh, yeah, it's a busy time because, uh, you know, since returning to work in mid-January, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, South Africa, our academic uh, year runs slightly differently to elsewhere in the world. We start uh, more or less the second week, third week of January, and then run through until uh, normally the middle of, of December, and then that's our summer break. But um, it's been busy since being back at the office. Uh, we've had our master's and doctoral uh, examinations, and uh, I've had uh, three of my own students uh, succeeding, passing, actually four of them, if I think about it, uh, two Master of Divinity students uh, who wrote wonderful uh, theses, uh, many theses as part of their Master of Divinity uh, program, and uh, two PhD uh, students, uh, one of them who worked on animal rights and animal theologies, I'll say, a little bit more about that, and the other who worked on notions of identity in relation to the market economy. But before we talk about this, don't you love the background here behind me? Um, I'm actually recording this on Zoom uh, behind my little MacBook, and uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite Zoom backgrounds. I actually took this picture myself with my old Leica M8, which I don't own anymore. This was a couple of years ago that I took this picture, more or less from Mooley Point uh, in Cape Town down uh, near the waterfront. And um, yeah, I know this is my Leica M8 because if you look above my shoulder here, you can see that there's a, a little bit of a dust bunny there. Can you see that there? And that was a speck of dust that was on the center. And I was so afraid of cleaning it because I didn't want to damage the sensor. But um, yeah, this was sunset. Uh, one evening and uh, I had a 21 millimeter Voigtlander lens and with a crop factor on the Leica M8, um, it must have been, I guess, somewhere close to about, uh, yeah, 30 millimeters or 35 mil uh, and a really beautiful, beautiful uh, picture. You can see Robin Island there, by the way, and a ship coming into the harbor. Uh, I probably should have dropped, if we go with a rule of thirds, I probably should have dropped the horizon a little bit uh, so that we could see more of this guy or raise the, the horizon a bit. But anyway, one of my favorite uh, shots. So yeah, as I say, it's been a busy time, but uh, it's been wonderful to be back at uh, the university um, for a month now. And uh, I'm back in my office. In fact, most of our staff and uh, many, many of our students are back on Monday, this coming Monday, the 14th of February. We begin with our Theology Day. I'll put a link to that in the show notes if anybody's interested in joining us. And that's going to be a wonderful day. This year, our faculty is reflecting on notions of uh, space and particularly spatial justice and the spatial turn. Um, what does it mean? to inhabit specific spaces. Now, if you think about this as a Christian theological uh, point of view, space matters. You know, the fact that, that uh, Jesus is incarnated means that physicality, um, bodily presence, where we are in the world matters. But of course, we know spaces can be um, an opportunity, a catalyst, for example, uh, for flourishing, but they can also be uh, a, a source of pain. You know, think about uh, some of the architecture in which people live. I, I often uh, think about uh, those visits to Berlin where there's quite a lot of sort of brutalist uh, Soviet era architecture, particularly on the eastern side of uh, Berlin that was uh, developed in the 60s and 70s. And boy, if you're there in December and it's gray and you've got these, you know, very radically functional sort of <laughs> brutalist uh, buildings, it can be, it can be quite a a thing to live in that. So space is an important thing, and particularly a faculty such as ours, just to say for the American friends who are watching in, uh, in South Africa, as in England and other places in the world, faculty refers to the school of theology, not the people who work, the staff. In America, faculty are professors and lecturers, 
but uh, in England and in South Africa, the faculty is actually the school of theology. Now, if you think about a faculty such as ours and that incredibly beautiful building that we have um, in, in Stellenbosch, I may even be able to pull up uh, a picture of it as a virtual background. Yes, I can. Um, yeah, so this is our uh, theology building. You can see it there. Um, it's an absolutely stunning building. That's my office, uh, more or less there. And this building dates back, um, you know, more or less to, uh, to the, the, the sort of uh, early 18th century. And of course, the University of Stellenbosch began there in 1839. But that comes with all of the baggage of colonialism and apartheid. And what does it mean for a young black South African uh, to enter into that space, uh, to, to claim it as their own? What does one need to change about, for example, the naming of classrooms, um, the, the pictures that are displayed on the wall? You know, our first um, woman uh, professor that we had uh, was uh, Professor Elna Mouton, who was later dean. But if I remember correctly, she only joined uh, the staff in, in 2000. So to think about it, from 1859 all the way until the year 2000, not to have any women, what does it feel like for women to, to enter into, into that space? So that's what we're thinking about. And uh, on Monday, we'll actually uh, have some artists, some theological reflection. Our, our own dean, Reginelle, wrote a wonderful um, a wonderful chapter for a book by Elmarie Costandius. I'll link that in the show notes as well about the notion of visual redress. And for anyone who's interested, a couple of years ago, I recorded um, a video in 2018 at the Humboldt University of Berlin, where um, they also had to think about this notion of visual redress. And particularly, there were a number of Nobel uh, Prize winning um, professors that they list all of them on a wall who were associated with national so socialism, with uh, Nazism. And the question was, what do they do with these persons? Do they erase them from their history? Well, of course, that's not a responsible thing to do, but you can't leave uh, their, their persons, their, their figures, um, you know, uncommented. One needs to be able to offer some kind of, of uh, you know, commentary on these persons and their work. So they actually have a very interesting thing, and you can I'll put a link to this video in the show notes if you want to go and see it. But what, what they uh, did with their uh, work, and I've seen this in other places as well, for example, South Africa House in London has a very big mural uh, which depicts the arrival of the Dutch settlers in the 1650s, but they've covered it with plexiglass. And uh, over that, uh, there's writing that invites the, the, the person who's viewing this artwork to think critically about things such as race, you know, who holds dominant power in the picture, from what perspective was it painted, the perspective of, of the Dutch Empire, the Dutch East India Company, their economic interests, um, how are indigenous persons uh, depicted, for example, in these artworks. Um, so I've seen there at the Humboldt University uh, under these uh, professors who, who uh, were, were Nazi sympathizers or members of the National Socialist Party, they, they actually offer a sort of historical uh, critique under them. So these are some of the things that we are thinking about in terms of our own building. How do we justly reclaim the space for a new generation? Of, uh, of persons who are studying there. But yes, as I say, you know, this is some of the work that I'm thinking about. And I, I just wanna mention uh, two things to you uh, today. I've been thinking a great deal about what it means to be a person who authentically wishes to hold on to, to the precepts, the virtues, the commitments of the Christian faith. And um, one of those things is the work of peacemaking. You know, we read in the scriptures, for example, that um, Jesus is described as the Prince of Peace. Um, you know, we read this in Isaiah, it's in the Gospels as well. Um, we read, for example, particularly in Matthew's Gospel, um, you know, with uh, the Beatitudes, that, um, you know, Jesus speaks about blessed are the peacemakers, you know, blessed are the meek, you know, all of these uh, certain uh, characteristics, sort of virtues of, of Christianity. And I remember thinking to myself once, you know, the work of peace sometimes tends to be treated as if it is easy work. Um, it just means the absence of violence. But of course, peacemaking is something that requires a great deal of energy and commitment, even 
sacrifice. And I've been thinking a great deal about what it may mean to create peace in the world in which we live. You know, I've, I've just finished reading that wonderful book, uh, The Lonely Century. And um, my goodness, it's, it's a magnificent, magnificent book. I really highly recommend it uh, to, to anyone who's interested in, uh, in understanding something of the malaise of our age, the ways in which we are separated from one another, collapsing into identity, identity politics and populism and misrecognition of one another. But in the book, one of the things that, um, that gets highlighted is this notion that um, you know, we, we tend uh, not to, to want to expend the kind of energy that's necessary in order to connect ourselves with others. It's far easier. Uh, my own research on, on race and identity has shown this. It's far easier for us to collapse into the prejudices with which we grew up, to, to inhabit the sort of social imagination of our culture you know, that all men behave in certain ways, all women behave in certain ways, that people of a certain race live in a certain way. And of course, you know, those kinds of categories are not only untrue, but they're also hurtful and harmful. And I was struck by two quotes from Stanley Hauwas. Um, the first one is from his beautiful little book called Prayers Plainly Spoken. Now, if you don't know about this book, um, Stanley Hauwas uh, at Duke University, he was a a professor there at, in the Divinity School, opened his uh, lectures with prayers. I had the privilege of attending some of those lectures. And in 2003, uh, some students encouraged him, or it might have been a year or two earlier, um, encouraged him to, to publish his prayers from the beginning of his lectures. And this is one of those prayers uh, that, that uh, he prayed. Listen to this. He said, saving God, free us from hardness of heart. Take from us all pride and pretension and strip us clean of all that makes us incapable of being witnesses of your gentle love. That's a strong call, to be witnesses of God's gentle love. He goes on to pray, make us worthy agents of your peace. Make us worthy agents of your peace so that even as we contend with one another, even as we have to engage with difference and disagreement and sometimes to correct, to rebuke, to lovingly engage with one another, he prays, even as we contend with one another in the world, that it may be said of us, but see how they love one another. Now, uh, just, just to make a comment on that last piece, when I've been doing marriage counseling over the years with, with young couples, um, I often ask them, so you're going to get married now. Uh, tell me a little bit about conflict. You know, how do you deal with conflict? And sometimes you see people, because you're a minister, they don't want to disappoint you. They say, no, Reverend, we, we, we never fight. <laughs> and then I know one of two things is happening. Either they're not being honest with me, or perhaps they're not being honest with themselves, or they're not courageous enough to be able to face those things that cause hurt or hardship. Because think about it, every single relationship will have some measure of conflict, uh, particularly loving relationships. We choose to love the other, particularly because they are not the self. We're loving the other. And the otherness of the other evokes sometimes within us. What, what initially causes us to recognize beauty and difference can sometimes lead to a bit of struggle, a bit of hardship, a bit of conflict, you know, because they don't do things the way that we might want them to be done, or because the person whom we love might see the world in a different way or approach things in different ways, that can lead to conflict. And um, yeah, I have seen over the years that in those relationships where people give up on conflict, it's often because they've lost the energy of love. They're no longer committed to saying, how can we find the energy to overcome this obstacle? Because think about it, in, in, a, in a healthy relationship, um, very often conflict is that catalyst. We, we love the person enough to say, let's, let's find a way to deal with this difficult, prickly, perhaps hurtful situation to speak to them so that we can overcome this uh, in order to live with greater freedom. And I think peace requires the same thing of us. It's one of the reasons, for example, why I'm so deeply committed to what's called white work, to working with particularly white South Africans, but I think this applies to white persons all around the world, to say, what is there that we need to know about our whiteness that, that claims the world in certain ways? What is there about the whitening gaze that looks upon the world 
in certain ways that gives us certain privileges and opportunities that are not the same uh, for, for everybody. And, and how do we, we think particularly about undeserved privilege, privilege that has been won through war and conquest over generations? And how do we deconstruct that so that, so that there can be forgiveness and reconciliation and healing? And that's difficult work. Okay, the second quote that, that strikes me is, um, is this one also from Stanley Hawass, where he says, peacemaking as a virtue. So peacemaking as a virtue is something that we, we do as an, as an act of virtue, um, requires imagination that's built on the long habits of the resolution of differences. Now, now think about that for a moment. If peacemaking is to, to be something that we do in our societies, it requires of us the possibility of imagining a different future. Um, it's one of the things that keeps me so deeply committed to the concept of forgiveness and reconciliation with justice in South Africa. Because what is the alternative? Is the alternative enmity? Is it destruction of the other? Is it the annihilation of the identity or the will of the other? And can that ever be Christian? What is the alternative to giving up on peace and forgiveness? And I don't think there can be a Christian alternative. So peacemaking as a virtue, says Stanley Hawass, is an act of imagination, being able to imagine uh, what the future might look like, built on the long habits of the resolution of differences. He goes on to say, the great problem in the world is that, is that our imagination has been stilled since it has not made a practice of confronting wrongs so that violence may be avoided. Now, what I hear how I was saying there is that we haven't had the courage to, to approach, to name, to deal with wrongs. And so what we tend to do is we tend to collapse into the laziness of violence. I mean, the annihilation of the other, the, the removal of difference, the desire to make everything conform to our particular view of the world is a form of violence. And whether it's waged in wars, whether it's waged in our world, whether it's expressed in our institutions, um, that is not the peaceable way. So he goes on to say, in truth, we must say that the church has too often failed the world by its failure to witness in our own life the kind of conflict that is necessary to be a community of peace. So people often say to me, well, I left the church because it was a place of conflict. I've heard people saying, I had a fight with this minister or that member. And I say, that's precisely the reason to stay in that church. You know, think about this. If we can't model healthier ways of living together from this peaceable community, how will the world ever know it? And so this is where Hawass ends. He says, without an example of peacemaking community, that's the work of the church, learning to resolve difference through imaginative imagination and living, he says the world has no alternative but to use violence as a means to settle its disputes. So this has been on my mind, and I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on this. I think you know, I think that as Christians, we, we have to style ourselves according to the virtues of the Prince of Peace. We have to find ways to commit ourselves very, very deeply towards the peaceable kingdom, the reign of the peaceable God here on earth. And that is going to require uh, a great deal of effort, a great deal of commitment on our part. So I'd love to hear, what do you think about this? How do you think that we should uh, work for peace? How should we wage peace instead of waging war? What is there that we can do in order to establish more truly peaceable kingdoms, whether it's in the small communities in which we live, our relationships with family and friends, the slightly larger communities, the places where we learn or work or serve, or whether it's in our larger societies, the global inequalities, national inequalities, that we face in the world today. So yeah, remember, this is not a lecture, just a thought. And uh, thanks very much for, uh, for tuning in today. Let me say two quick words about those PhD theses. Uh, congratulations to Kijun Kim, who wrote a wonderful PhD on uh, animal justice and animal rights um, and an ethics of dealing with animal cruelty 
in uh, in East in South, Southeast Asia. In particular, he was he was interested in in thinking about what might a theology mean that's not just an eco theology that sort of generally uh, deals with notions of the ecology, but but because one of the problems with that, by the way, is that very often eco theologies are still anthropocentric. They center the human person. He was wanting to ask, what would an, an animal-centric theology look like? And what might be the ethics of an animal-centered uh, theology? And there are a couple of things to say there. Number one, God loves animals. Uh, number two, that animals are not a means to human ends. Uh, and number three, that God certainly has a will and a desire that humans and animals should find ways to live together in peace. The second uh, PhD, which was uh, successfully defended, was my uh, colleague and, and friend, uh, soon to be Dr. Steve Pearson. Steve uh, did some very, very interesting work. He was particularly interested in the ways in which the market economy misshapes our identities, leads us towards notions of radical individualism. So um, this, by the way, was, uh, you know, something else that I read in in that book, The Lonely Century, is that you know, neoliberal capitalism and, and neoliberal democracy has caused us to center the individual, um, particularly in the West, as, as being absolutely autonomous, individual rights above all else. And uh, we've ha we have to ask some questions about that. So he was particularly interested in the work of Colin Gunton, um, and particularly Gunton's Trinitarian theology and my, how this might help us to, to push back a little bit on, on radical individualism and the forms of identity that uh, elevate the self above all else. He also looked at the work of Timothy Keller um, and particularly Tim Keller's work uh, around faith and work and, and was critical of, of the ways in which uh, people like Tim Keller um, have inadvertently bought into a sort of modern um, form of, of neoliberal capitalism and neoliberal democracy, which sometimes is, is blind or ignorant uh, to the ways in which, you know, the Christian tradition uh, historically and certainly from the Christian scriptures might differ with, uh, with the ways in which contemporary society operates. So those will become available um, if you just search for Stellenbosch and Sun Scholar, go to Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology and you look for uh, doctorates, you'll find them uploaded there uh, very soon. But as I say, thanks very much for watching. Um, I hope this video hasn't been too long. We'll see now when I end. But as always, I'd love to stay in touch. Uh, please feel free to uh, drop me uh, a message on the comments here on YouTube, uh, Dion Foster, or on my website, dionfoster.com, or on Instagram, or Twitter at Digital Dion. So thanks very much for watching.